is currently Director General, National Maritime Foundation. Gentlemen, welcome to News Tonight. If I can start with you, Vice Admiral Chauhan. Now, the minister said in Bengaluru that the Indian Ocean is a shared asset. But that's not all. He also said a couple of, uh, made a couple of interesting points. He said, and I'm quoting him here, the negative impact of conflicting claims in some maritime areas of the world highlight the need to ensure peace in the Indian Ocean region, number one. Number two, Indian Ocean region countries have demonstrated mutual respect for a rules-based order and commitment to abide by international law. And number three, easy, uninterrupted access to the open seas and respect for international law, essential for stability and security in the region. What did you make of the minister wanting to contrast India's behavior in the Indian Ocean with China's in the South China Sea? Your thoughts, Vice Admiral Chauhan? Well, <clears throat> let me say one thing at the very outset. You know? Hello? Yeah, please carry on. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. So let me say one thing at the very outset. <clears throat> in the um, next 100 odd years or so, India will either succeed as a nation or it will fail. And the determinant will be how cleverly, how adeptly, how adroitly we are able to dance upon the maritime stage. So it is with undisguised delight mm -hmm. that I am able to entirely endorse uh, the the uh, words of the Honorable uh, Raksha Mantri today. Uh, I also want to add sure. that uh, India's ad uh, adherence to an internationally consensually arrived at rules-based order is visible and in evidence for everybody to see. The India-Bangladesh uh, boundary issue is a case in point. Absolutely. Where India's respect for international law, India's respect for comity amongst nations, mutual respect, transcends any narrow interests that India might have had at any given point in time, such as the narrowness of the Chinese approach to international law, which is amazing because China has publicly and frequently committed itself to adherence to the international norms that govern maritime interaction and maritime intercourse between nations. Now, there is much that uh, needs to be said about how we will go about this, that we don't look at the Indian Ocean as a uh, Indian lake, much as uh, in contrast with the, the view of China to look at the South China Sea as a Chinese lake. We look at the Indian Ocean as, as correctly said, as a shared asset. Our fundamental strategy mm -hmm. within the Indian Ocean is founded upon constructive engagement right. and comity between nations, which is mutual respect between all. So we seek to engage the whole of the Indian Ocean Indeed. on equal footing without an overbearing or condescending approach to anybody. And that is what is symbolized by the Prime Minister's enunciation of Sagar and also our commitment to the international um, engagement is also typified by India's um, launch of the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative right. as a follow-on to uh, Sagar, widening the scope of India's strategic geography from its western segment of the Indian Ocean mm -hmm. encompassing the entire Indo-Pacific. Absolutely. So I think I'll stop there and um, take it up further as the, as the uh, conversation progresses. Absolutely. Thank you for that uh, very elaborate uh, opening intervention there, Vice Admiral Chauhan. Ambassador Parthasarthi, now our interests, mm -hmm. India's interests in this region extend from the Horn of Africa all the way down under to Australia. And you've been our envoy to Australia. In your estimation, this uh, idea of hosting an IOR defense minister's conclave, uh, how do you look at it in terms of addressing issues such as security, in terms of trade, connectivity, counterterrorism, and so on? Well, let's. We have settled all maritime. And some of those agreements are tripartite because the. Uh, like say uh, India, Myanmar, Thailand. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, the, because there are three countries involved. Uh, the only problem we have had with pa is Pakistan, but that also is merely with regard to <coughs> the alignment along the Indus River. So we really, do, and we have not had maritime tensions of that score. So I think the biggest asset to bring in <coughs> is the fact that we have negotiated bilateral and trilateral agreements <coughs> with all our maritime neighbors mm -hmm. so that there are no disputes. The opposite can be said of China. It has maritime disputes with all its neighbors. Mm -hmm. It violates international law mm -hmm. by uh, rejecting the verdict of international tribunals like it had with Philippines and it is going to have with many others. So on the one hand, you have a country respecting international law, the law of the seas and norms. And you have China, which only a week ago authorized its Coast Guard to open fire on any who claims as transgression to its territory. Mm -hmm. So the first point is the goodwill in the in the region. Right. Second, that we are primarily committed to uh, freedom of the seas, freedom of navigation, according to the rules of the law. There is an international convention on this. So that is one aspect. But the other aspect certainly is. Uh, one of a growing Chinese concern right on our back door, mm -hmm. uh, on our borders. Uh, you have the uh, arrangements they have with Sri Lanka and very clearly we should uh, link recent developments to China actually now going to spend on Humban Tota, mm -hmm. which will give it, which in effect will be two ports, Colombo, which it will control in terms of administration. And Humban Tota, further down south, where it can use use as a maritime base. Uh, while uh, Sri Lanka may swear that's not the case, it is a problem. Uh, uh, same thing with regard to Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, Gwadar has now become Pakistani territory. Uh, I'm sorry, Chinese territory. Because uh, virtually China decides who can come in and who can go out even at the gates. Right now in Gwadar. And uh, you are going, going to have a situation of two more bases likely in the coming years for China in Pakistan soil in the Sindh area, region. So these are all in the works. So in effect, the Chinese will appear to want to get around us. Uh, the other thing is that we should be also very clear that uh, balancing Chinese powers, power requires partners, primarily because we observe the rule of law and China does not. Absolutely. I think you have the Quad, which is India, Australia, and uh, uh, the US. Uh, and also, uh, you know, we are increasing maritime co cooperation with everyone. One of the concerns was the Chinese coming into the Bay of Bengal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's good that we've established maritime co uh, cooperation. The Navy is doing well in arranging for a submarine for use by uh, Myanmar, which is mm -hmm. uh, one of the things which China has not done. So we have a proactive policy. Sure. It's good that we have got this whole Indian Ocean Rim. But we, I must tell you, we have always had meetings between service chiefs of the BIMSTEC countries. True. Countries to our maritime. Uh, I'm, in fact, the last meeting I attended, I, I think what is important is to follow up on these. Things. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to build, the, you already have the advantage, the asset of settled borders. You are not quest, uh, questioning the um, uh, maritime integrity of any country. And we should use that asset because, uh, let's face it, uh, in terms of uh, maritime sea power construction, the Chinese are way ahead. Mm -hmm. That's something I'm sure the Admiral can, would be in a very position to say we know how to look after. Right. Point taken, Ambassador Parthasarthi. Vice Admiral Chauhan, I want to touch upon another aspect in the Defence Minister's address uh, in Bengaluru. He spoke about projecting or making India a global R&D hub. He says India is one of the world's largest startup ecosystems. And he says Indian Ocean countries can leverage these sectors for mutual benefit. Plus, he says, and I'm quoting him here, 
India is ready to supply various types of weapons systems to IOR countries, unquote. Your thoughts, Vice Admiral? Well, I think that this is a um, step that is long been due. The uh, fact that uh, India is now shedding all these um, earlier shibboleths of, um, shall we say, being holier than thou, mm -hmm. uh, and is playing the game of providing, of being a net provider of security mm -hmm. in all its dimensions. The first I would like to emphasize is the fact that if we are going to contest China, we must do so at the strategic level, at mm -hmm. the operational level, as well as at the tactical level. Right. So the Indian Navy will operate most um, in the van insofar as the operational and, uh, and the tactical level is concerned. And India, mm -hmm. as a country, is, uh, I think, playing rather admirably uh, now at the strategic level as well. So the way to handle or the way to prevent China from interloping into the Indian Ocean is really to stitch the Indian Ocean region together in such manner that it leaves no fissures, no cracks, right. no chasms through which Chinese strategic game moves may be played out. So therefore, playing at the strategic level is crucial. Generating both capacities as well as capabilities within the Indian Ocean region is certainly an area that India can, is, and must leverage. It is absolutely correct that India is an innovation hub. In the, India is a startup hub. It's probably the, it's certainly the largest hub, uh, startup hub in uh, the Indian Ocean region. And it is one of the largest startup hubs in the whole of the uh, Indo-Pacific region. Mm -hmm. Coming to, and therefore, we would most, we would be peculiarly placed uh, if we were not to leverage and not to play the game right. to our strengths. Why would we play the game to our weaknesses? We must play on our strong suits. And so what are our strong suits? Our strong suits are number one, that we have at the moment, Ambassador Partha Sarthi said that uh, you know, China is way ahead in naval construction. That's where the strategic game comes. China's ability to concentrate wholly upon the progression of its, uh, or the protection or the provision of assurance and insurance mechanisms for the uh, assurance of its uh, overseas trade is predicated upon the fact that all this trade either must flow through or originate from countries in the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. Therefore, what the Indian Navy does or doesn't do in order to cement the Indian Ocean region's maritime constructs together is has a huge multiplier effect. I also right. want to mention that the decision to provide arms to provide defense products across to uh, countries of the Indian Ocean region mm -hmm. is something that is in demand by them. The number of countries right. that approach India seeking, why do they approach India seeking uh, uh, help in this regard? Why? They do so because countries gauge very carefully, militaries of countries particularly gauge extremely carefully what is gloss and what actually works. What is the tail attached to what you provide? So when India provides capacity, that is material wherewithal, boats, ships, aircraft, submarines, tanks, missile systems, these are capacities. India also takes great pains to build capabilities, which is human wherewithal, organizational structures, training mechanisms, right. legal frameworks, all that in the country that is rece receiving this, in, this uh, largesse. Let's take a case of Mauritius. Where we went into Mauritius, we didn't start off by saying, here you are, take, take 30 um, patrol boats. No. We said, here are the number of patrol boats that we can afford to provide, not only because it's in your interest, but it's because it's in our interest mm -hmm. that we need our economy to grow. Our economy can only grow when there is a flow of money. Money as Zoltan Mertze famously said, money is a coward. Money doesn't go where there is turbulence and risk. Do we want money? Of course we want money because our core national interest is the economic, the material and the societal well-being of the people of India. That requires money flows, whether that money is in the form of trade, in the form of investments, in the form of actual cash flow, doesn't make any difference. Money must flow. Therefore, 
stability must prevail. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we are driven as a Navy, we are right. driven as a maritime power, we are driven as a country to ensure stability as the prerequisite for prosperity in the region. That is what Sagar means. That is why we are offering arms, ammunition, developmental skills in military capabilities mm -hmm. across to our entire region. We, right. our interests, one last thing is that our sure. interests, India's interests are India's. They are not determined by China or by Pakistan. Our interests, if, if I could magically erase China from the map of the earth, it would not change one single maritime interest of India, one whit. So therefore, the way we handle the Indian Ocean is not, I repeat, it is not right. a reaction to China. It is the desire of India to stitch the region together in mutual win-win situations. As a sure. spin-off from that, you will handle China automatically. Point taken Thank by you. Admiral Chauhan. Uh, I'll give Ambassador Parthasarathy the last word on this, on this discussion. Ambassador Parthasarathy, we've seen India take a number of steps in the recent past. We have what is called the Sagar policy, security and growth for all in the region. There's Sagar Mala, there is Project Mossum, there is Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, uh, there's Prime Minister Modi's five S's, Samman, Sambad, Sahyog, Shanti and Samriddhi, and also India is now developing a comprehensive maritime domain awareness picture in the Indian Ocean region. Looking ahead, what do you expect from India to be doing in the near term to not only generate goodwill for itself in the region, but also confront other challenges that could erupt in the days and months ahead? Uh, look, uh, when you look at what is our security perimeter, mm -hmm. it does not stop just at the Straits of Malacca. Right. It is one of the most important maritime relations we have. Beyond that is with Vietnam. And not to speak of Japan, of course. Right. So, uh, I think what we need to look at is an integrated strategy. Okay. Military reinforced by economic growth. Right. Internally and economic cooperation with the region. Uh, I'm afraid we could do much better uh, we could have done much better and we, we can do much better uh, in the coming years. But really now I sure. think we are getting the shape and contours of what is meant by the exercise of national power. Mm -hmm. Previously, we were shy of using the term national power. And power is not just military. It's economic. It's your innate strength, your democratic structure, it's resilience. Uh, these all add to what we call as comprehensive national power. Mm -hmm. I think for the first time I'm seeing happily that India is looking at all this in terms of its comprehensive national power. Right. One maritime power, you've got to have your own uh, industrial uh, growth, your startups, your high-tech high features right within India. I think we are looking at it in an integrated manner. And I'm particularly happy with the presence teams of the DRDO, wherein they're going for specific projects, and particularly in the area, uh, in the area air power. Mm -hmm. Also, we are seeing the, the one thing with the Navy is they do a very, very good job themselves. So the, the, uh, uh, theirs has been a very well-planned, integrated growth for, for years now. And there is certainly a service that looks ahead. So, yeah, right. this part of, and I think with the CDS in place, the armed forces are going to be much more integrated than they were in the past. Mm -hmm. And as I said, in the case of Brimstech, you already have these meetings of steel. I think we should carry it forward into the All right. maritime, maritime areas in sub-regions. All right, on that note, Ambassador Parthasarathy and Vice Admiral Chauhan, thank you so much for making time for us on Newsnight tonight. Thank you once again for your time.